Coming at you from the OLR Podcast Studio. Eh, it's really more of a basement. Coming to you from the OLR Basement Studio. But it's still a podcast. Coming to you from the Podcast Basement Studio. Yeah, but you still need to say OLR. Coming to you from the OLR Podcast Basement Studio. Oh, that's way too many words. Coming at you. That's not enough. You still need to say OLR. Let's just start. It's OLR. You're not going to start talking? Yep. Yeah, there you go. Hey, bonus show tonight. We're uh, we're trying to get back on track. We just recorded one three days ago. So. But we're back. Trying to get back on track. Here we are. And Sunday we're, night. Woo-woo. We're going to give you two bonus shows. Two actually, tonight. So two kind of short ones, but going to be ones. Uh, the first one, we're going to... We talked about it last week or maybe the week before. Last show or the show before. You know, we would do an interview and then kind of wrap other stuff around it. Sometimes it worked out. Sometimes it didn't. But tonight, you had a really... Really good guest, somebody I always enjoy listening to. Again, y'all talk above my head whenever y'all talk sports. But you got to hold your old buddy, Mickey Ryan, and you've got Mickey Ryan on tonight. Great interview, about 45-minute interview or so yeah, after really we got our, got our headphones and everything work. We had a little... Uh, Glitches. A little glitch that we... We blew out Mickey's eardrums and ours with there yeah. at once, but so, we anyway. got past it. So that's what we're going to do. Like I said, we you guys just got a show uploaded Thursday night in your... In your um, subscriptions here, so yeah. So here it is Sunday. We're going to drop you two more. Yeah. So you can't say with that uh, little sabbatical we went on for a few weeks. We're loading you up now, well, plenty of stuff to catch up on. So, so for anybody that doesn't know, Mickey Ryan, he's on one hundred four point five. He's three uh, HL. Is that what yeah. it is? From two to six every day. Three HL with Don Davenport, Brent Daughtry. Of course, uh, great connection with those three. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's my favorite show. I love the midday one eighty also, but those those three have a really uh, strong uh rapport together so uh so titan's training camp is going on right now which is what he's been covering and what he kind of comes on to talk about out in this big july heat yeah we, we yeah it's so, real nice weather to be standing out on the sidelines in yeah we're talking to mickey about um some of his beginnings at Ar- arkansas state and the, the stadium uh, atmosphere last night the open practice and just what to expect from the titans this year and we uh finished up with some nashville talk and just you know, a lot of nashville in general talk so yeah so uh, we'll go ahead and hit you with the interview with Mickey Ryan. We, thanks, thanks to Mickey as always for jumping on. This is probably his third time on the show. I think. Yeah. So. And he's he's always good to listen to. That radio voice really comes out. Yep. So. All right, here he is, Mickey Ryan. All right, well, welcome to the show tonight. Um, from one hundred four point five's three HL, we have Mickey Ryan for the first time on with us since we came back last year. So, how are you tonight, Mickey? Doing great. Good to be back with you, fellas. You were on our very last show when we took our hiatus back in September of 2017, I believe. Okay. Well, I guess, you know, I, I Ricky Bobby did. If you're not first, you're last. And I actually was last. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all, all good, man. Happy to be on where I can. How do they say get in where you fit in? So happy to do it. I was trying to get up with you uh, before the draft. I know I was trying to talk to either you or Jim Y. Y'all are two of my favorite ones to talk to on the show about anything Titans, anything Nashville related, but I couldn't, we couldn't make any schedule, anything work schedule wise at the time. So glad to have you now. And I'm going to cover a few things. I'm sure you're blue in the face about talking about, but we have it on, we don't cover a lot of sports on the show anymore. We just hit it kind of periodically. So, um, first off, I seen you, you took your kids back to Arkansas state, you know, where your, your old stomping grounds over the weekend. How was that? Was that their first time being there? No, my daughter's been there a bunch when I worked there and, during the time we lived back in Arkansas, it was five years, so she was out there with me all the time. Okay. But they they changed a lot of stuff. Uh, my little guy, I don't know if he's if he's ever been there, so that was the first time for him. Um, but I they were with my mom last week, so I went to pick them up and thought I'd take them out to look around the old stomping grounds. But uh, uh, I know I brag on Arkansas State a lot, but they're building a a football facility that's that's pretty unbelievable, and. If there's anything nicer in the group of five, I'll be surprised. And I've been in a lot of, of power five football facilities, and this is as nice as many of them. So I, it, it's it's pretty cool what they're doing over there. They just had to get rid of me to really move forward, I think, is what happened. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you how much has changed since you've been there. What, what year did you leave there? Is it when you started with the station? Yeah, 20, uh, 2014. I came here. In September of 2014, so I'm coming up on five years on 3HL. Yeah. Doesn't seem that long, does it? 
Uh, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. <laughs> but but no, ultimately, no. Five years have flown by. I know. Last time you talked on here about when you got hired for the station, you you told them flat out, you know, I'm I'm the anti Clay Travis, basically. Um, and they and they they still wanted you, obviously. So, and you're still here five years later. How do you think the fan base took it? Where Clay's a more brash character, and you're kind of just uh, more of a laid back character. Uh, did you see? Did you get any pushback from any fans, or you pretty well re- well re- received the last five years? Oh no, I, I got I got plenty of pushback. Uh, there are always people out there on social media who are happy to tell you how bad you are at anything, <laughs> or how bad they think you are. Yeah, so, that's true. Uh, no, I I got <laughs> some people were very creative in how they chose to tell me how much they didn't like it. <laughs> but 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 overall though, the, the response was really good. I've been on the zone before. Uh, Brent and I had done a show on there in the middle of the night, cold overtime, and I was surprised at how many people actually remember that. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's funny is, you know, people have asked me, you know, well, do you know Clay? And I, I said, yeah. I mean, we're actually. I mean, he's a really great guy, and we get along well when we see each other and always friendly, and our wives know each other and, you know, see each other in passing sometimes. So, you know, he, he has kind of launched himself onto this, this great thing and just left an opportunity at 3HL that I, you know, I, I think when people he kind of took it out on me that he left, you know, I, I was just, I was just kind got a phone call, you know, about coming back. Um, but Clay's done great, and it, gave me an opportunity on 3HL and he's a good dude now we definitely are kind of different in how we do our broadcast stuff but you know he's great with his kids and he's a good dad and you know has a great family and that's you know we're a lot alike in that regard you know try to try to be the best family guys we can we're just different as broadcasters but uh but he's a great dude and, and, you know, I will always appreciate the uh the opportunity that I've had and then he's gone to uh, his next next part of his career I promise, no matter how much negative reaction you got, it probably doesn't even touch the mentions he gets daily on social media, <laughs> which he embraces. Oh, no, he's oh gosh, yes. I mean, he's he's uh, you got to have a, a special kind of a thing inside you if you can be a lightning rod like that, where you can just say, okay, today I'm, a bunch of people are going to be mad with what I say, and a bunch of people are going to be happy with what I say, and really, that's kind of all of us. That's yeah. You know, if I go on tomorrow and I say, gosh, I've watched every Titans practice but one, and and I, you know, I haven't seen this guy do this, and I haven't seen this guy do that, here's what I think their record's going to be. I'm going to have some people agree, some people who disagree. So, you know, it's uh, it's just the nature of the business. But but he, he does kind of seem to, he enjoys that part of the business, I think, more, more than most. <laughs> the, the, you know, he likes, he likes a good discussion as much as anybody. I can't remember. I mean, I have a bad memory about things that I read about, but there was one thing that stands out to me, just kind of the epitome of what you're saying. There was a guy that tweeted him and said, it must suck to have to act like you're such a butthole to be a millionaire. And Clay tweeted him back and said, well, it's not an act. I'm a multimillionaire, bud. (laughs) So There you go. There you go. So. All right, we'll come- I, I have been to achieve millionaire status, so he's still way ahead of me there. For all of his fans and for the people who don't like me, he, he's got me beating the bank account too. It sounds like. <laughs> well, coming off the um, the practice last night at Nissan Stadium, how was the atmosphere from uh, from all the fans? And was it a was it a good gate last night? I didn't see a whole lot on social media last night, but um, just just because I hadn't had a chance to go back and look, but I know it, it was uh, delayed a little bit by the weather. But how was the turnout last night? We were, there were several of us in the media kind of having a discussion. There were, I, I don't know what the number is that the Titans put out. I honestly don't know. I mean, I know there were, if I had to put a number on it, I would say definitely more than 10,000. Mm-hmm. Um, and when everybody moved over for the concert that, um, oh gosh. Um, Jake Owen. Jake Owen did. Then you could really see how many people were there. The rain sent some people home and I had a couple other people tell me, you know, I got down there and it was still on the lightning delay. And we sat in the car for a little bit and just left. That ran off a few thousand people, mm-hmm. but I was, I mean, I thought it was a nice crowd who stayed and, you know, there were a couple times they got loud. Delaney Walker made a catch and then he made another catch and he made another catch, but his first one, 
everybody there really, I mean, it got loud in the building. There were enough people for it to get kind of loud. So I thought that was a neat moment, but I, I would imagine you know, anytime you open the doors to your facility, you want the maximum amount of people there, especially when you're trying to do something nice. And You know, in the case of Amy Armstrong, trying to do something free and cool for your fans. But with everything that happened, I bet they were really happy with the turnout, especially with how many people who stayed. She's really stepped her game up doing that for Nashville. You know, you know, one of the main things in getting the draft was the Florida-Georgia line concert along with the jersey reveal. So, you know, you know, it's always made sense to go there. I mean, you've got all these country music stars at your, you know, um, at your doorstep there. So why not use those guys? You know. No, I agree, and and I don't know why the franchise. It, it, I remember this, and I don't remember much, but when the Titans, when the new stadium was built, and they changed from Oilers to Titans, they used to have pre and post game concerts. Outside the stadium, I remember seeing Wilson Pickett there, of all people, who was a Stax artist from Memphis. You know, he was Mr. Midnight Hour. And I remember seeing some country acts as well. I and mean, then over time, you know, when you win and things are going well, you just open the doors and people show up. And I think they got a little bit spoiled, maybe, in past regimes over there. Because when you're winning and you open the doors and people show up, you think, well, gosh, why are we spending all this extra money on concerts and stuff? And since Amy Adams Strunk has been running the show, I mean, this whole narrative that the Titans are cheap, that could have been said before, but you can't say that anymore. You know, they spend money on facilities, they spend money on contracts, and they spend money on fans and season ticket holders. And last night was just another illustration of that. So uh, I can't tell you how, how impressed I've been by Amy Adams Strunk. She's She's completely changed the narrative of this team. And, and I say that, you know, Tommy Smith, who's her brother-in-law, that had control after Mr. Adams died. Um, honestly, I, it, it's really hard to even... Uh, he, he wasn't spending money on facilities. You know, they, had a, they weren't necessarily spending a lot of money on players. They didn't really have an identity. You know, he, he got... Uh, he, Gosh, it, it's hard to even put into words. Uh, it just it, it was not a good ownership team for the team having him. Yeah. And she's been a complete 180. I mean, it turned in the complete other direction as far as, you know, they got a new practice bubble. They've got these sand pits that they can run in. Um, they completely redid the weight room. They did the redid the rehab, the medical facilities. They redid the cafeteria where they eat every day. They've redone a lot of the stuff at Nissan Stadium. They've done a bunch of improvements over there. You know, they made Taylor one at least briefly. He was the highest paid offensive lineman per year, although I think one other guy's passed it since then. And, you know, Byers the highest paid safety per year. And, you know, all, all that narrative's gone. And for season ticket holders, it, it's just amazing what she does for them. And, and really, the other thing is, guys, she's just present. She's there. Oh, yeah. You know, I'll never forget turning around in Kansas City, and it was seven degrees or whatever it was. And she went in the field day. And I don't know what time it was in the day, but it was literally about seven degrees. And she was out there in the parking lot um, at Arrowhead Stadium just hanging out with people. You yeah. know, that's just who she is. She's been great. And if, and if, there, if there's still talk and chatter about the Titans being cheap, it's just because people's not paying attention. Because, like you say, you just nailed it all on the head right there. She's changing the narrative left and right, whether it be the facilities or contracts. So I was happy to see them go ahead. Absolutely. And, yeah. So. Um, so you talk about like expectations for fans. Of course, it was great to see Delaney back on the field last night. And I'm sure, um, the roar, I mean, he was so missed last year, you know, very first game of the year, he goes down with that, the fractured ankle. So, um, that's, that's a lot of stability that Marcus didn't have last year. So, um, there was a great conversation, um, on the midday 180 last week about fans expectations where last in the last two or three years, they've been getting pumped up. And I know like Paul Kaharski tries to kind of, temper those sometimes but they're saying like this year you're not hearing as much because a lot of national media is picking the titans fourth in the division and you know you got the one guy the fancy guys picking them to go three and 13 um what do you think of a, a fair expectation for a titans fans are this year and and does it seem to you that they're down a little bit around nashville um we had the same discussion about the balls one day and, and I know the Mendo guys have talked about this too. And 
I think the whole state of Tennessee, when it comes to football, whether you're a Vandy fan, whether you're a Tennessee fan, or whether you're a Titans fan, or uh, and now you know, I don't want to get in the weeds with Middle and Tennessee Tech and Austin P and everybody, but the the two SEC teams and the Titans, I think there's a lot of people who are just saying, "Okay, show me." Right. I, I'm not. I'm not going to get my hopes up. Just show me. Wait and see. And we did a a poll with all fans, and we said, "You know, where's your excitement level?" And, and literally, whatever the option was, it was basically wait and see or show me what you got was, was the one that got the most answers. Um, the first two days they opened practice were Saturday and Sunday. And that Saturday crowd was one of the biggest crowds I've seen out there in a long time. Mm-hmm. That was opening day, and they were signing autographs and all that stuff. But I looked around and thought, this is a really good showing. And there have been times in the last couple of years where I've looked around at an open practice and there, it didn't feel like there was anybody there. Right. And I've told people who have little kids, if they ever dreamed of meeting a player, you need to take them out there on a weekday open practice because they can meet as many as they want to meet and get their autographs. Oh, yes. Selfish- there just hasn't, hasn't, been a, hasn't been a lot of people out there. Yes. Selfishly, I miss those days for me and my son because now you can't – It's. I mean, you still get to meet the players, but like, you know, during the – 2013, 2014 seasons and 15. Uh, we would, it, you weren't just meeting players. You were sitting there by the fence talking to them <laughs> during camp. You know yeah. I mean? It was like 10 minute conversations with Delaney Walker because there was nobody out there. Yeah. But I'm glad to see and you. It, you know, they'll, they're opening it up tomorrow afternoon. I think it's open again. And we're doing our show out there. And, and I don't know how many people will be there. It's supposed to be hot again. And mm-hmm. People have jobs and have stuff to do. And some school districts already have the kids back in school. Right. So that'll knock some people out you who know, could normally go. But I, I, I think there's just a lot of people who are saying, wait and see. Now, I will say this, and, and I believe it. This roster, to me, is, is the best one that John Robinson has has had. It's the best roster that we've had here in years. Um, but the Colts have gotten better. Mm-hmm. And what if the Jags have actually found a quarterback and Nick Foles? Because we know what their defense can do. Yannick Ngakwe, you know, reported, and he's got 29 and a half sacks in the last three years. And, I mean, there's, you know, the, the Texans, Deshaun Watson has been good at times and has really beaten up the Titans. And, you know, they still have their receiver, who I think is the best in the NFL, the Texans. So the rest of the division has gotten better, too. So, you know, when you say, okay, we've gotten better, we've gotten this much better, but if everybody else has gotten that same amount or more better, I think that's why fans are saying, well, let me just see what happens this year. Yeah, and I think that is what's holding them back because the Vols are, you know, understood to be in more of a rebuild, you know, in year two. This roster was coming off a playoff win when Mike Rabel was hired, so you're not in that yeah. state of rebuild, and you do have the best roster under the, you know, John Robinson regime. Um, the, the From who I've talked to, it's mostly, and it's it's – you know, people were pretending like this team just didn't finish nine and seven three years in a row, and with all the injuries they had, and they're still one game away from the playoffs last season. With all the injuries that happened to the starters, everybody that I'm talking to, it seems like they've got a little bit of, um, you know, Marcus Mariota, um, just a little bit of afraid of what whether he's going to play or not. What have you seen thus far in camp and otherwise with Marcus? Well, he's put on weight. And one day he wore a little shirt at his press conference, I guess, so everybody could see that he's got bigger. <laughs> it was funny, you know, around that's what that, you're supposed to do. Like, oh, man. But yeah, he's, that's, well, you know, that's how. And when I was younger, you'd just buy a smaller shirt if you want to look bigger. I learned <laughs> right. that a long time ago. Right. Um, but he still moves great. You know, that's never been a problem for him. Um, It's really strange. He seems to have good command of the offense. Mm-hmm. He threw deep a couple times on Saturday, and so did Tannehill. Tannehill, which which this is no surprise. Tannehill I, it has a stronger arm. You know, if they're just going to cut it loose, I, it, Tannehill's going to throw it farther than Marcus. Now, I say that, but maybe they'll have a contest one day and that won't happen. <laughs> but if you ask most people who's got a stronger arm, they'd say Tannehill. And it seems like it's kind of proven itself over the years of both of their careers. Uh, but like the first series Saturday night, last night in the stadium, Marcus went six of seven. His only incompletion was the throwaway, and it was just a bunch of intermediate routes. You know, Tajay has had a good camp, and he's taken really taken advantage of AJ Brown being out. 
and hit Tajay four times on that drive and Humphreys once and Ferkser uh, once. And that was his six completions. And Tajay actually got open in the end zone and scored a touchdown on that opening drive for, I guess they were the white team against the blue team. They divided everybody up. So Marcus looked good. And the idea and some of the stuff we've heard is that, you know, they've tried to simplify it and they're trying to make things as friendly for him as they can. And, um, and, and, and that seems like the case watching it, but they had some red zone stuff that they did and they really couldn't get anything going in the red zone. Hmm. You know, Marcus had two drives and he was six for seven on one, then zero oh for three on the next. And he had a one pass got dropped and he had a long pass that actually they called pass interference. So there was still some stuff that happened on the drive. It wasn't necessarily his fault. Um, but he's looked good. I, I would never say to me that he's looked great. But I'll say this. When Derrick Henry gets healthy, if the offensive line can gel early with Dennis Kelly and then for the rest of the season, the table will won. And if Delaney Walker can stay healthy, which I think he will, and if Adam Humphreys is who we all think he is, I think they can move the chains a lot without Marcus having to, to really be a hero. I think they've built a team and a scheme that Marcus can have real success and the team can have real success and him not have to go out there and throw it, you know, 36 times a game. Do you think this is the best offense on paper that's ever been in Tennessee? Um, Receiver-wise, no, especially? That. No, I, I can't say that just because at one point, you had Derek Mason and Frank Wycheck and Eddie George and Steve McNair, and the offensive line had Brad Hawkins and Bruce Matthews. And, I mean, there have been too many other talented guys who've come through. But this is the most talented team on offense in probably a decade. Yeah. I would agree. I mean, I, I would say that. But, but that George McNair era where you had a Hall of Famer on the offensive line was Bruce and, you know, those were just, those were such talented teams. And, you know, Frank was, you know, I, I put Delaney and, and Frank right up there together, but we don't know about running back. I mean, Eddie George is a borderline Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. You know, Steve probably didn't have enough stats, but Titans fans love him and think of him like a Hall of Famer. So I, I wouldn't say ever. I, I would take that classic Titans offense over these guys, but this is a really talented group. Um, how do you feel about the Lawan suspension? I mean, are, are we just lucky that there's a lot of depth there on the offensive line, but it's, it's four really tough games to start the season. How do you feel about that? Well, there were 13 people. I went back and looked. 13 people got busted for PEDs last year. 13. Hmm. And at any given time, there are 1,696 players on all 32 teams. So when you throw in everybody that played one game or five games or ten games, they got added to rosters later. I mean, I don't know how many more hundred people that is. Let's say you had, I mean, that's 18, 1900 players maybe that cycle through the league in a year and 13 got busted. You know, I mean, I don't think he did anything knowingly and I don't think he did anything willingly. But it put the team behind the eight ball for sure. Now, they do have depth, and Dennis Kelly's great. But we were talking on the show the day before we found out about the suspension. And we said if football had an expansion draft like hockey and you could protect one player, I said the one guy that I would protect first would be Taylor the one. To me, he's the most valuable guy on this team. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, he got suspended. Yeah. So, even not, with not ideal. Yeah, even with depth, no, nobody's replacing uh, 77. No, I mean, he's, he's the most visible player on the team, and he's an offensive tackle. Think about that. Yeah, his, per his, his personality is perfect for Nashville. I mean, you know, he was the one in the commercials, you know, for the draft, taking them to losers and to Hattie B's and everything else. I mean, he's, per he's perfect for Nashville. Oh, yeah. And he's a guy who's willing to step up and be that big personality that a lot of guys who come here just don't want to do. Yeah. You know, the, the Titans are a lot like the Predators. It's just a bunch of quiet guys who just want to play ball and be good people in the community and do what they do. You know, there's not a lot of flamboyant characters. I mean, there's P.K. Subban and Taylor Lewan. That's it. And P.K.'s gone now, so that market belongs to Taylor. 
Yeah, nobody else is shotgunning beers at the uh, up in the suite other than Taylor Lewan and his boys. Yeah, you know, he's the leader on all that stuff. So, you know, there aren't many teams who say, who's the most visible player on the team? They go, oh, it's a tackle. Can we expect to see Mickey Ryan on the bus anytime soon? I don't know if I rate high enough to get on the bus <laughs> with those guys. Uh, it would be fun for sure, but uh, I, I may be pretty low down their pecking order, but uh, they're, they're certainly good dudes, and that's a great podcast. It's we're, really funny. We're going to have to talk to Matt Neely about this. Oh, I, yeah, I need to bust Matt's chops for not getting me on there. But, uh, no, Matt's a good guy, and, you know, you guys are proving it, and they're proving it, and so many others. You know, you can do your own thing and do your own podcast and have your own audience and, and do a great job and put out a great product that people love. So, you know, it's just another another case of, of some guys doing something fun and people tapping into it. I had a buddy of mine from Cookville who's trying to set up a drinking challenge with Will and uh, – Taylor, because they called it Cooksville on the um, on the uh, Rich Froning mm-hmm. uh, episode. They kept they kept saying Cooksville, even though Rich told them a couple times it was Cookville. So my buddy was he's, he's we were we were at a restaurant bar there in Cookville. He said, "Take a picture of me, send it to the boys, tell them I'm ready. I'm ready to get them to Cooksville and have a drinking contest." <laughs> no reply yet. <laughs> okay, well, Lord help your friend, because I think those two can put it away, and you got to remember. These are two huge guys. I was like, you know, these aren't normal sized people. <laughs> Taylor w- Lawan is not a normal human being. He's not a little fella by any stretch of the uh, imagination. My little, my buddy is little. He's about five two, and uh, he actually was. I seen him in a drinking contest. We were at Tootsie's one night after a WWE event, and the wrestler Jack Swagger at the time was with WWE, and a lot of the divas were there, but Jack was the only one. He he went about six five, six six, and and my buddy said. I'm challenging you to a drinking contest. He said, uh, you are? <laughs> he said, all right, let's do it. He said, you buying? And um, it went about as well as you thought it would. Yeah. Six. <laughs> well, at least your buddy's getting some good stories. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's got stories. Uh, Taylor Taylor Lawan, I don't know why I can have trouble saying his name, Six seven three hundred and nine pounds. Mackie ain't got much opportunity with this. His leg's not the size yeah, of he- Taylor Lawan. <laughs> Yeah, he's and he's every bit of that. <laughs> I mean, he's every bit of whatever they wish to mass. He is every bit of it. <laughs> you know what I like about Taylor? I went to that Houston flood relief um, thing he had at Twelfth and Porter a couple years ago. The um, where he raised money for the Houston flood, and I was sitting there, and it was his event. He hosted it, and we were just sitting there, and I was kind of just having a drink in a booth by myself. And Taylor slides in. I don't, you know, I don't come up to him. I wasn't bothering him. He slides in the booth with me and introduces, and he shakes my hand, puts his arm around me, takes a picture and everything and introduces himself. It just cuts up and that's him 24 seven. Really? He stayed outside in the stadium and signed autographs, uh, Saturday night longer than anybody else. Until the concert started, he's been up there and signed autographs. He stayed longer than any other player. And he does that a lot. And he tells you where he is with the fans. Absolutely. Well, another, to offset the bad news of the day, another great leader for the Tennessee Titans on defense side, Kevin, Kevin Byard got his extension, got paid that day, the highest safety in the league now. Um, obviously, that was good to get that out of the way so there wouldn't be any awkward feelings throughout training camp. And, you know, some news came out this week that Dick LeBeau said he was the best student he'd ever seen. Where, I mean, where do you even put that compliment? I, Dick LeBeau used to call him his son. If you yeah. brought up Kevin Byer, he'd go, oh, you're talking about my son. You know, and Dick LeBeau is in one of the absolute unparalleled legends of the game. So if Dick LeBeau said you were a nice person, then, I mean, you could just retire on that from, you know, from, from anything. And I'll tell you this, I met him when Dick LeBeau got to town. I met him and I wrote him a note. And he wrote me back a note. I mean, I just thanked him for his time and, you know, told him I admired his career and we needed to talk some music again sometime. And the next time I saw him, he had written me a note. But he called me by name and talked to me about music. Like, he said, Mickey, hey, man, when are we going to play guitar? Like, he, he referenced that conversation and the note. That's that's how sharp Dick LeBeau was. But um, Kevin Byard is, is such a versatile guy not just in the pass game, but in the run game. He's a complete safety. He understands their system. He's a leader on the field. He's a great guy off the field. 
you know, having local ties, he's beloved by fans. You're never going to hear something terrible about Bayer. He's not going to get in trouble off the field. You know, if you're going to take money and spend it on a guy, if he's a fantastic player on the field, who's a fantastic human being and beloved by your fans and everybody in your building, and then you top it all off with Dick LeBose giving him the praise like that, that tells you that money is well spent. And he's had a good camp, and um, if that defense has a chance to be special, what they what they need is more outside pass rush. Yeah. And whether Harold Landry can do that and whether, you know, Cameron Wake playing 50% of the snaps and or the other guy that we've kind of seen step in is Sharif Finch. He's the other guy who's – because Cam Wake's going to be about a half-the-time guy. That's what he was in Miami. All right. But Sharif Finch has sort of been the other guy that we've seen on the outside with Landry and with Cam Wake. Um, if they can get more pressure from the outside and don't have to continually steam it up and get it from, you know, Jayon Brown and Logan Ryan and Kevin Byer, it's great that Dean Pease has the ability to, dis- to disguise blitzes in this defense incredibly well. And you've got some great blitzers, you know, from all areas of the defense. But if they can get more push from the outside and wreak more havoc, um, once you're okay, he gets healthy and, and, Guys, Jeffrey Simmons, he came out one day and just stretched in front of us, and that's the most athletic thing I think I've ever seen. Like he, he did the splits, basically, and his was touching the ground. And this guy's a beast human who was sent back in time. He's like a sophisticated cyborg. <laughs> so if something, if something happened and you got him well by December and you got anything out of him down the stretch, which I don't think they're counting on it, yeah. But if something happened and they did, oh my gosh. It, it, Jarrell Casey is going to wish so badly that he could have had this guy earlier in his career. He made uh, Jarrell look small in the picture I saw him yesterday. Oh yeah, he's huge. He's huge. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make you make a prediction on like you said that all or the, all the division has gotten better. It went from the joke of the league three years ago to four. You know, teams that can you know possibly make the playoffs. You know they should have had two last year. Um, yeah. What do they got to do other than health? What do you see? <clears throat> um, I think the key guy on the offense is, is Corey Davis, and a lot of people have laughed at me about that. And I said, but no, hear me out. Hear me out. On the defensive side, I think it's just if they get pressure from the outside. I feel good about everything else. If they can get pressure from the outside, that secondary is as good as any secondary. Once Jarrell gets healthy, it's a good defensive line with Daquan or Daquan Jones. I think Brent Urban is a huge low-key addition on the defensive line. Mm -hmm. I think an inside linebacker with Jay on and Rashawn Evans and Wesley Woodyard, you know, that's a position where sometimes only one of them will be on the field and you have three guys that could be that guy. You know, I'm just, as long as they can get pressure from the outside, I feel great about the defense. Um, for the offense, it's, and again, I said this about Corey, and I don't keep the kind of answer. Don't hear me out. I think he'll have more than anybody because that's the nature of his game and where he's going to be doing most of his work. Although we didn't really see much of him Saturday night, I think they're still kind of figuring out. I think the quarterbacks are figuring him out. I think Marcus is figuring him out. But we've seen a lot of him being uncoverable in seven-on-seven and one-on-ones where just no one can stick to him. Mm -hmm. So I think he's going to lead the team in catches. But I think Corey Davis should lead the team in yards and touchdowns. And if that happens, here's why I think he's the key guy. That will mean that Marcus Mariota has gotten him the ball a lot. (laughs) And that will mean that they've thrown the ball down the field some to get him the ball. You know, that means it won't be all check downs, that they've gotten him the ball down the field. The other thing is, if he gets the ball um, <clears throat> and gets his fair share of targets, I think that'll open up, A, the middle of the field for Humphreys and Delaney. But I think it'll also help open things up for Derrick Henry. You know, if, if you've got people focused on what's going on downfield, they can't focus as much on the run game. So, you know, it feels like there's, I mean, think about the Ravens game last year where the Ravens weren't even concerned with the Titans throwing the ball. They just pinned their ears back and went and went at Marcus 
play after play after play after play after play. After play. Eleven so sacks, yeah. I, I, uh, it, it, and I was there. It, it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to watch. I don't leave. Um, I don't leave a lot of games early. I left that one early. <laughs> well, you missed some of the beating. That was smart. I couldn't, <laughs> but uh, but I I think Corey Davis needs to have a huge year because the nature of Humphrey's game. I think he's going to have a big year, and I think Delaney's going to be Delaney again. He looked great Saturday night, and that's really the first extended look we've gotten in him. And you know, the offensive line, like you guys mentioned, they're lucky to have Dennis Kelly. That's some depth that most teams don't have. So they've got a chance to be really, really good. And Tajay Sharps had a good camp. Mm-hmm. And we hadn't even seen A.J. Brown because he's been hurt twice in drills. Yeah. You know, we haven't really seen him do anything. So A.J. Brown, I think, has a chance to maybe, to maybe be the biggest yards after the catch guy. Because if you look at his time at Ole Miss, he was really more of a slot receiver, although he did play a year on the outside after some injuries. But he looks like a running back. So I think there's going to be times where you throw him a three-yard pass, and he goes for 12 yards, and he goes for 10 yards, and goes for nine yards, because he's going to be so much bigger and stronger and powerful than a lot of these cornerbacks that would be covering him. I mean, he, he, looks like a, he looks like a running back or a safety. So he doesn't look like a receiver. So I, they've got weapons and they got an opportunity. You know, Arthur Smith has been there longer than anybody. He, he knows the, the personnel. You know, he's been in the offensive meetings for years. He's seen what's worked for Marcus and what hasn't. I think they're going to give Marcus every chance to succeed. But, you know, they got a lot of draft and free agent capital spend in, on the offensive line. And, you know, that Derrick Henry's a second-round pick. And Deion Lewis was a big-time free agent and got a lot of money in. They just signed Roger Saffold to a big deal, and LeJuan got a big deal, and Conklin was a first-round draft pick. And I mean, we can just go on and on and on. So if, if, if Marcus can't succeed this year, if he can't succeed, then it's not because they didn't try everything to help him. Absolutely. You know, we've said that over and over again on the show. And it's tricky to, I mean, you, 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 I know you guys have talked about on the radio, like, what is the number? You know, is it? Is it twenty t- touchdowns? Is it thirty touchdowns? But you know, and the bad thing about it is, if if he isn't what the Titans need him to be, I still feel like they'll finish anywhere from between eight and ten wins. Then there, there again, you're going to be drafting from eighteen to twenty, realistically. And you know, you're not going to get a quarterback. Probably, I mean, you know, they're all going to go in the top ten as usual. So it's a uh, it's going to be a trick. You're going to have a lot of depth and a lot of good veterans on a team with maybe restarting with a rookie quarterback next year. I well, hope not. Like I hope you not. said, you know, let's say you win eight or nine games again. Well, you're not getting Tua and you're not getting Jake Fromm. Right. You know, you're not going to get those guys. And what's Justin Herbert? And there'll be some guy who emerges this year because, you know, there always is. Yeah. There'll be some guy that emerges who's like, you know, middle of the first round type guy probably. And so then the Titans might have the decision to make. But the wild card at the quarterback thing is Tannehill. Absolutely, yeah. Because Tannehill's been a starter, and the guys. Marcus said some of the nicest things about him the other day. We actually ran the audio, and Marcus said some of the, and he says nice things about everybody. But he spoke glowingly of Tannehill post practice the other day, and they're they're getting along, and you know his leadership, and so Tannehill's the wild card in all this because. Let's say you're John Robinson and there's some second or third round quarterback that you like. And I don't have the list in front of you, but let's just say that because you're not getting from and you're not getting to unless you win two games, right? Or three or four or whatever. So so let's say they finish in the middle of the pack and they're just not sure again. Well, Tannehill might be the option because you're not going to get probably the top two or three quarterbacks if you go 500 or, or right around there. And you know, who's the free agent class of quarterbacks? And who's it going to be? When you look at the, the that crop of guys, it's nobody that's really going to turn your head. Right. So, you know, if you're going to suck, the Colts, the Colts may have nailed it better than anybody in history. They sucked and they got Tate Manning, then they were great, and one year they sucked again <laughs> and they got Andrew Buck. I've said that. You know, so- what a run. I've said that so many times on this show because me and my Titans buddies would be like, oh, I hope they go 0-16 without Peyton. I said, not me, because they're going to get Andrew Luck, and he's going to kick our butts for the next decade like Peyton has. 
I was the one yeah. guy not wanting and the Colts to suck that year. Yeah. And they have. You know, yep. if you're a Titans fan, that was a fun year, but then you saw what happened after that. <laughs> Yep, should be an interesting season. I want to touch on one more thing real quick. I love the segment you guys done kind of on the spot the other day about old Nashville. Um, that was really – I'm 35, so I've, I'm somewhere in the middle of the pack there. I've, I did used to go to Nashville when it was still, you know, not on everybody's radar. So that was a, that was a really fun segment. kind of took everybody back a little bit. We, we kind of – about once a year something happens and one of us mentions Rio Bravo or the Mix Factory or something, and then away we go. Yeah, um, but that's always fun to hear from people. And then the other one that gets people going, if you mention it, is Starwood. Oh, you yeah. You know that that always gets people talking because they love to talk about Starwood too. But, I love uh, Starwood. Yeah, that's always fun. Starwood was the best, man. It's such a cool place. Um, and that was one of those things, like you know, Cinderella saying, "You don't know what you got till it's gone." Yeah. You know, I don't think people fully appreciated Starwood until it wasn't there anymore. But uh, no, Nashville's changed so much. All the hot chicken and every country star opening a bar. There's a lot of stuff that's kind of been lost over the years that you know that, that people really miss. You know, there's, there's great stuff and cool stuff and fun stuff, but uh, there's a lot of cool, you know, old landmark things that have disappeared over the years that are missed. And anytime it comes, anytime it comes up on the show, we get a bunch of tweets and we get a bunch of calls and you know, a bunch of people respond to it. Yeah, you know, I can't go back because we're not really locals. We're we're an hour and a half from Nashville, but you know, so you know we don't go down there often enough to like be like at the local spot. So we'll still go to the you know to the places on Broadway, and it's just getting to be too much. It's, you know, I remember as much as maybe two thousand eight or nine, you could go to Tootsie's like early on a Saturday night and still get a, a place on the first level. But now you can even go like on a Wednesday sure. a Wednesday at five, you know, and it's packed on all three levels. So oh, we did our show at Acme Feed and Seed the other day for a Middle Tennessee press event. Mm-hmm. I think it was Monday, and it, and it was completely packed on a Monday. And yeah. that, if somebody had told me that, you know, the first time I moved here in the late nineties, I would see you telling me it feeds down there, but the that's just so deep. Yeah, will be a bar and will be full of tourists. I would have told you you were crazier than any human being on the face of the earth. It was a feed store when I moved to Nashville in the nineties. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. The first time. My grandpa worked in Nashville in the 60s and 70s as part of the union, and he was telling me about it. We, I went and talked to him the other day, and he said, you know, of course, like you're saying, the Acme was a feed store. He said there was a furniture store that took up, like, so many of those buildings. Like, it was just, it was the feed store, then a furniture well, store. Paradise Park. That was it. That was the furniture store. Oh, really? It turned into Paradise Park later on? Yes. That was a three-story furniture store. Oh, okay. That sold furniture while you were walking around down here. You got window shops for lazy boys. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, it's changed. It's it's changed for sure. It's uh, I still love it, but it's. I always say I love it that it's that close. It's convenient for us to go have a good time and catch everything. That's you know all the concerts and stuff. But it's far enough away I can come back to my farm and hide out from all the craziness. <laughs> well, I'm as a guy who grew up in the middle of nowhere and. You know, grew up driving a tractor. I, I I appreciate both things, just like you. I, I like to go down there sometimes and see what I can see, but I also like to you know get my dirt bike and go turning around and <laughs> you know I like that part of life too. We always joke, me and Lucas here. We always joke when we meet people from small towns. They're like, "Oh, I graduated with uh, two hundred people." I'm like, oh, "I graduated with twenty one." <laughs> so we got you beat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was seventy. So oh. you know, I had a big school though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> seventy for me. Yeah. yeah. That's that's like the other schools around here, the other counties. That that's also why us. we don't have a high school anymore, though. So yeah, <laughs> they they took our high school away about twelve years ago. It's just a K eight now. Oh man. Yeah, we had to consolidate with our rivals. It was the worst. Oh my god. <laughs> it's okay well, now. That happens to several schools around us, but you know we we were in the big city of Harrisburg, Arkansas. So we like old. <laughs> if you could get rid of one in Nashville, would you get rid of the pedal taverns or the scooters? Well, the mayor got rid of the scooters. Um, I thought so, but I still seen some the other day. I was there last weekend. The, the pedal taverns um, are at least a little more courteous. They just kind of do their thing. I've almost been hit by, them, by a bunch of those scooter people. Yeah, so it's crazy. I was I was pretty happy to see them go. Yeah, I, I still seen, like I said, I was there last Saturday, and they were, they were all over the place, though. 
Yeah, I don't remember what the drop dead date was on that. But okay. I never got the th- I never got the point of the Pale Tavern. You know, I've had some you know drinking experiences over the years in Nashville. Never once have I said, you know what, I'm gonna get you a good buzz and go work out on the Pedal Tavern <laughs> and sweat. <laughs> Well, it's just more of, you know, you're seeing downtown. Right. You're yelling, and, you know, you're just going to funk and everything in down there. I guess is how they're selling it. Yeah. They inspired the party barges and the tractors and everything else. There's like five different variations now, right, down there? Oh, gosh, yeah. There's everything in the world down there now. <laughs> well, um, we're, what's the status of Whataburger coming to Nashville? I know you've been fighting the good fight for a long time. Is, is anything, or, have you got us one yet? Well, you know, I was down there, not Father's Day of this year, but literally last Father's Day, and the manager of the store, I was eating with my family. We woke up that day, and my wife said, we'll go do whatever you want to go do. I said, I want to drive to Birmingham and eat a lot of burgers, <laughs> so we did. And we went to Wahlburger, and um, um, the manager, a, a guy came over and was talking to me. He said, this guy's on the radio in Nashville. There was somebody else from Nashville up there. and um, the manager said, well, I'll tell both of you guys, we're going to be there eventually. You'll see. Yeah. And so, and they've basically sold out to a corporation and they're, so people are saying that means they'll expand. So we'll see if it's Nashville or not. I stopped holding my breath a long time ago. Surely to goodness, Nashville will get one. I mean, what, I mean, they've got everything else, but I've never had it. <clears throat> I hope you don't think it's weird that every time I see a Whataburger com- commercial, I think of you. <laughs> no, I, I think that's a lot of people. I, I think I so. get several posts today on social media about it. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, well, Mickey, we uh, we kept you longer than I meant to, so we'll. Uh, I do appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man, and you got training camp well, kicking back off good. tomorrow. So. Yes, sir. Well, all good. Y'all holler at me anytime. Always happy to jump on with you. All right, it was a good time. Appreciate it. All right. See you later. See you. Thanks. Bye. All right, everybody. That was Mickey Ryan. Another. Really good interview with Mickey Ryan. If you like that, go back and check us out. Uh, you can find us on Stitcher and iTunes, wherever you get your podcast. We're also available on YouTube. It's a audio version uh, on YouTube, so you just click the video, let it play in the background, listen to it just like you would on iTunes or Stitcher if you've got no other way to listen to a podcast. But uh, you can also check us out on social media on uh, OLR Podcast, One Lane Road Podcast, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. DK will also answer on his all of his social media from time to time hey go ahead and subscribe to us wherever you're at if you're on youtube subscribe itunes subscribe stitcher subscribe leave a like a comment thumbs up thumbs down whatever you got to do we'll we'll take any of it 